autopsy is a Caribbean term. Um, I once made the mistake of saying that it was a Jamaican term, and I got so many DMs from people from Trinidad being like, how dare you? Um, <laughs> so I'm never making that, mis- that mistake again. I, apo- I apologize to anyone Trinidadian listening to this. It is, a, it is a shared term. I'm very happy for all of us. Um, but it's a Caribbean term that essentially refers to a person's upbringing or manners. So it's so when, you, so when you actually break the word down, it is brought up C, which then translate into how you were brought up. It's essentially how I would define it. So how were you brought up? What is your, like, and would I say, like, what, what is your brought up, see? <laughs> like, how is the way that you use yeah, it? So the way that it would be used, it's, it's often used um, to say when someone doesn't, does not have good upbringing. So they would say you have no brought up, see, you know, that, that person doesn't have any, any brought up, see, you know, or, you know, that, that person has very good brought up, see, that mean that they have been properly raised. Properly raised. Okay. Mm-hmm. So this is very much a novel that is a coming of age and mm-hmm. it feels a mul- like a multi-leveled coming of age mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. You have your protagonist whose name is Akua. Is that mm-hmm. the proper yeah. pronunciation? Yes. And Akua is dealing with like double bereavement. She's a 20 year old as we meet her. And over the course of her young life, she has lost her mother mm-hmm. and then more recently has lost her younger brother Bryson, both to mm-hmm. sickle cell anemia, mm-hmm. which is a hereditary illness. It is that has it is plagued... a hereditary illness that's um, most popular in black um, in black populations, or unpopular, as it were. Unpopular, <laughs> <laughs> but very sad. I mean, there's a very sad beginning to this book with Bryson's yeah. health declining rapidly in the opening chapters, and then he passes away and. She's already lost her mom. Mm-hmm. So you have this character and her family who are sort of adrift in a way. Mm-hmm. Can you just talk a little bit about the situation that she is in? Because sure. I, I feel like we need to get listeners who have not had a chance to read oriented. Yeah. So the way that I often think about the book is that it's not just a coming to age, it's a coming to consciousness right like all of the losses that you just listed of losing her mother and her brother um is further ex- exas- exacerbated by the fact that she's also like lost her home lost her homeland lost her culture and in many ways kind of lost her sense her sense of self and so when people when, when people ask me what is the overall trajectory of this of this novel it is Akua coming home to herself. It is it it is it is her kind of like facing and reckoning with and rec- and reconciling all the various parts of her, all the various parts of what she has experienced and what they all mean. Um, so it's a story not only of coming to terms, but also but also of coming to love, right? Of coming to love the kind of very un- unique kaleido- kaleidoscope right, off the various aspects, experiences, and cultures that make her who she is. Well, this is also a gay coming of age story. Mm -hmm. This this is a 20 year old woman who is a lesbian in, for at least a a good portion of the book in Jamaica, which is a Mm -hmm. country where it is not easy to be a gay Mm -hmm. person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you, and this is, you know, I think I might've been able I might have known a bit about that prior to reading your book, but it's not something that I have a ton of familiarity with. Can for you sure. talk a bit about what it is like for gay people in Jamaica? For sure. So what I can say is that like, for me pers- personally, I've lived the majority of my very queer life, not in Jamaica. Right. And so a lot of what kind of defines how I understand moving through space and moving through um, society as a queer body is kind of coded and informed by my immigrant experience. And so one of the things that I wanted to really explore through this novel was this idea of, yes, it is true that Jamaica is repeatedly ranked as one of the top 10 most violently homophobic cultures 
And also there is a robust and thriving queer community on the island. What's crucial is how you are coded within that Jamaican queer queerness, right? Or kind of like knowing what you can do, what you can't, how to be safe and when you are not, and to kind of show the show the kind of like um despair despair this disparities between those two experiences of being like coded as queer as an immigrant and coded as queer as a Jamaican. And so one of the things that I always make a point to say is that, yes, it is difficult, but it is also difficult to be black in America. Like it is there, there, there are all of these difficulties that um, oppressed groups find joy and find richness and find meaning within. Um, and so that was one of the things that I wanted to dig into. And the homophobia in Jamaica is tied to religion, would you say? Is that it what is. it is? Deeply, deeply. Um, Jamaica is a highly Christian company, um, not company, con country. The um, colonizers did an excellent job of really impressing the need for Christ um, um, upon uh, the populations there and so that is kind of the prime the primary weapon that's used to combat homosexuality is religion and then the second is culture right like because the religion has become such a deep part of our culture it is seen as un-Jamaican to be to be queer or to be gay and so that's one of the things that I wanted to call into question with this novel and to really kind of burst open and to break apart which is that if you are a queer Jamaican, it's not it's it's not as if you're Jamaican and all of a sudden you hit eighteen and you and you kiss a girl and you and you become queer. It is there from your inception, right? It is it is uh, an integral though often dismissed part of who we are, right? We are a culture of of like past of pastiches. We are you know West African, but not. British, but not now heavily influenced by America, but not right. This idea of mixing, right, of putting together disparate parts is how we have now created this culture that is arguably one of the most recognizable Caribbean nations in the world. And queerness is very much a part of that of that mixing. Well, another thing that your book draws really well are the ways in which within a single family that is part yeah. of the diaspora, there can be tensions, misunderstandings, core differences. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, I think in particular, when it comes to Akua and her sister, Tamika, it is, to, I'm, I'm, I don't yeah, have Tamika, it right in front of right. me. It's Tamika, yeah. yeah. Is the fact that Tamika returned to Jamaica mm -hmm shortly after the family landed in the United States. The mm -hmm. family comes to Texas first, Tamika then returns to Jamaica, mm -hmm. and then the family eventually ends up in Canada and Vancouver. Mm -hmm. But Tamika's personhood and nationhood is very much Jamaican, mm -hmm. whereas Akua is maybe less defined, like more American, more Canadian, more liberal in her yeah cultural bearing than Tamika yep. is. Tamika has kind of adopted the more mainstream Jamaican posture, Christian, mm -hmm. very religious, mm -hmm. maybe not as comfortable with homosexuality as mm -hmm. somebody who's from Vancouver might be, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and this is all within one family. Yeah. And I think when people move around and families break apart geographically, this sort of stuff can happen. Yeah. I think it can happen just within families when different personalities emerge. Some people yes. are just more inclined, I think, to embrace religious dogma than others. Yes. So yes. I think that that's, it's very deftly done. And the story really at the core of this book is Akua returning to Jamaica, sort mm -hmm. of in search of herself mm -hmm. and also in search of her kind of lost sister. She, mm -hmm. she's going down there to confront her because Tamika did not return to mm -hmm. the States or to mm -hmm. Canada to yeah. attend Bryson, their brother's funeral. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So Indeed. there's some real fam familial strife and there is a ruptured sisterly relationship. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, one of the things um, that I'm, I'm very, so I am the last born of three girls. And so I'm fascinated by how sibling order can completely change your o- orientation on the world. Because when I think of myself, right, as the, as the last born into a family of five, my formative memories are of being a we, right? I was plugged into this family, you know, two sisters before me and my, and my parents. But then I think of my eldest sister, right? She was the first born. There were no other children. She was born into being an I, right? And how that's so, that's so, that's such a, a seismic difference all within the same family. And then how does that affect your perspective, your evolution, what you want, what you, what you get or don't, or don't get. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that I wanted to bring to bear on the, on the novel was it's taking that same idea, but in terms of nationhood, right? That Tamika is very much, you know, um, oriented to like a Jamaica off the land because she has almost continuously lived there. Whereas Akua is oriented towards a Jamaica of the mind, right? Because most of what defines her Jamaicanness are her memories, you know? Um, and then what happens when you put those two orientations, those two ways of being, and you shove them in a car and they can't leave? How do they deal with each other? Right? They are supposed to be connected. They are supposed to be the most like intimate champions and like you know and people who like understand each other but there is this gulf right of experience of knowing of um perspective on the worlds that keeps them that that keeps them apart and you also have a a gay and straight divide between sisters Mm -hmm. religious non i mean these are all of a piece but i mean religious non-religious you know akua stayed with the family tamika fled the family Mm -hmm. and has been sort of living on her own and kind of creating her own life yeah um and it's interesting like i i um i'm with tamika tamika was the character that actually i was most fascinated by because i ended up making these decisions with her on the page where i was just like what are you doing girl and so in one in one sense you're right right she did kind of flee the family left them all behind abroad to go back to jamaica but then from a different perspective she kind of like returns to her family in the sense that she returns to the final resting place for her mother right which then goes back to to that idea of she was born into an i right it was her her mother and her father This whole idea of having other siblings came later. Her formative experiences are being that I in relation to those those two other formative forces, right? And so how would that then affect her psychology? How would that affect her sense of self? And then how would that in both wonderful and terrible ways affect her understanding of family? which I think is a very real and true thing that happens not just in Jamaican families, not just in immigrant families, right? When you see it like, you know, a family here in the U.S. and one person jets to L.A. and leaves everyone behind in Mich- in Michigan, you know, like what what kind of informs all of that? And then what does that mean in terms of your, your, your sense of self? Yeah, that sort of speaks to my experience. I'm a Midwestern kid who ended up in Los Angeles. There you go. So, yeah, it does. But I mean, wherever you end up, I think like, I think it's an interesting conversation to have mm-hmm. about capitalism and the forces of capitalism and the ways in which over the past century plus, maybe 120 years or something, mm-hmm. you've really seen this development where families fracture geographically in ways that mm-hmm. they never they never did previously. Mm-hmm. where you might have a brother who lives on the West Coast and a sister who lives on the East Coast and another mm-hmm. sister who stayed home mm-hmm. in the Midwest. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, what does that do to people to not have their family close and that to is, lose those familial question. social structures? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then you take that dynamic and you expand it internationally, which yep. is the story that you're telling. And I think possibly the story that you yourself are living at least to some degree, Mm -hmm. then I think that the, 
destabilizing nature of that is brought into even sharper relief. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, I mean, that's obviously on your mind. Like, do you have personal experience with this that you were reflecting on as you were writing this book? And are there like ways, maybe both positive and negative that you think your movement as a human in the world and in relationship to your family has impacted you and those you care about? For sure, for sure. So the thing um, that I often tell people, right, because this, this, this is a question that people are quite interested to know and understandably so, is that, you know, this novel is not a record of, of, of what factually happens to me. Right, like like I mentioned before, I'm the last of three girls. Therefore, I do not have a little brother. I do not have a, I, do, I do not have a, have any siblings who have who have passed. My mother is still very much alive. She was calling me just just before this call. Um, you know, all, like my my family unit, we are dispersed but intact. But what this novel is, however, is that it is a record of the emotional re realities that I faced throughout my life, right? So um, the kind of base geographic areas um, that, that I borrowed from myself and put into this book off Jamaica, Texas, Canada does reflect my own tradition. Trajectory. I was born in Jamaica. I was older when I left than Akua. I lived in Texas for seven years, various other places in between before making it to Vancouver. Um, then I, I returned to the US and now I live in New York, in New York City. And so when I look at this novel, I see kind of these shards of myself kind of like crystallized in amber off of really kind of trying to process those like incremental changes, those kind of turns in evolution that have made me this, right? And so um, that was, so writing this book was in many ways a cathartic release, right? Because through the kind of ventriloquistic act afforded by fiction, I could finally face some of those kind of like open wounds from my own develop, de development and my own kind of like breaks and cracks and my, and my, and my, and migrations of my own in a way where if I tried to say, this is what happened to me, the, the fear, the, the just, um, disorientation, the shame, the, you know, all those additional things that your brain does to save you from yourself would have kicked in. And so I credit so much of me, you know, being able to kind of look at and understand and honor all the ways that, that I have taken these various collect, the, these various aspects of myself and put them into something that is uniquely whole, right, with the writing of this book which also kind of ref reflects what I hope, if I did my job correctly, the, o the overall arc of this novel also tells, right? Is how this woman, right? This um, 20 year, year old woman, as she is kind of going forward in Jamaica, she is going back in time. And then that kind of like interplay of past and present, we see the rich, the rich, the richness that has informed who she has become. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. And I think what I'm hearing you say is that by fictionalizing a story that shares some things in common with your personal story, it gave you the distance you needed in order mm -hmm. to have the kind of cathartic creative experience that you exactly. had. Exactly. Like the only way I could have kind of really kind of like just sifted through the kind of emotional and psychological milieu that I had accumulated through my various like shifts and change from, you know, not just move, moving from Jamaica to Texas to Canada, but like having long hair and I used to wear push-up, push-up bras, you know, um, the only way that I could have really done that is through fiction. I don't think I, I, could, I, I could have done it in, in memoir or non or nonfiction because I needed to give all of that to something to like a thing that I made up but also had complete control over in order to see my own truth 
and therefore to see the meaning in a story like that and then be able to make it have meaning for somebody else. And then the other thing that I was hearing you say is that there are positives to adversity. Yes. I mean, there yes. are positives, there are positives to be derived from, for example, leaving your home country and venturing yeah. to two different countries and mm -hmm. having to sort of reinvent yourself in these places and find yourself in these places. Mm -hmm. There's a great education to be found in that sort of stuff for, for all of its difficulties. Absolutely. People who survive that process tend to be interesting people in my experience oh, and they, you. and resourceful and resourceful. You know, you have to learn how to adapt and you, yes. it tests you in ways that yes. you might not be tested if say you had remained in Jamaica and lived there your whole life and had mm -hmm. kind of been comfortable and fully entrenched in the place of your birth. Mm -hmm. uh, I moved within the United States as a kid, you know, we moved around a bit and having to mm -hmm. sort of start over again and make all new friends. And mm -hmm. that process is hard and mm -hmm. traumatic for a kid, but it also strengthens you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, um, was talking about this recently with my, with, with my wife about, you know, one of the people like why I love New Yorkers. <laughs> and part of it is that, you know, the New York stank is so distinctive and hilarious to me. I just think it's the funniest thing, but then also New York is truly a culture, like a place of such kind of clashing cultures and they're clashing all the time. And also just like such a gathering place of people who have been through so many different um, experiences, um, have you know, gone through various types and levels of adversity, that what you arrive at is something that you honestly cannot define easily on the page, right? That, that what you arrive at is a collection that is as kaleidoscopic as the cosmos. And I think that that is the beauty, right? When that's the, and that's the, the beauty that I try to impart through the language used to describe all of these difficult things, right? Is to kind of show the shine, right? To kind of like show the kind of glow that going through the kind of the pressure of that crucible, you know, the the final result of that is death is def, definitely pain, but also a kind of strength. Well, and I feel like in New York, it's a, it's a ton of colliding cultures and nationalities and backgrounds in a relatively small geographical space. Yes. Too small, too small. Maybe half of us should move out. Maybe it's a little <laughs> too tight. But the thing about it though, is that that enforces inter interaction. I say this as a Los Angelino, I want to say Los Angeles has more uh, diversity than any city or county in the world, you know, per capita or something like that. But the, mm -hmm. the problem is that it's so big. Mm -hmm. it's so yep. the neighborhoods get spread out and the cultures sort of, there's like tribalization that happens, I think mm -hmm. in a place like this, just mm -hmm. due to the la the size of it landmass mm -hmm. wise versus a mm -hmm. place like New York, where people are on the subway, people are on the streets, people are having to interact with one another more. And I think mm -hmm. that might be healthier in some ways, even if it yeah. does have its challenges. Yeah. And so that's one of the things that I am personally um, just obsessed with. Like, I I love LA. Like, oh, this poke, the sushi, like, oh, mwah, puts, New, <laughs> puts New York to, to shame. But it is true that, like, it's very neighborhood by neighborhood, right? Whereas in New York, between just the price of everything, <laughs> you go where you can where you can afford you might want to live with the other jamaicans on flat on flatbush but guess what honey you cannot afford that anymore so you are moving with the dominicans enjoy <laughs> um as well as you know you mentioned this before like this with the exception of the uber rich the subway is the city's great equalizer everyone rides it you know i've seen i've done the new york city thing of seeing multiple stars on the six squash between six 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 people looking very uncomfortable but how else are you gonna get across town at 5 30 on a friday right and so i think that that's also at that kind of aspect of the kind of 
um, said, the kind of said, said, sedimenting of experience, right? And what that kind of does to your perspective and to your personhood is also is also what I was trying to kind of like explore in this in this novel, right? Because we have Tamika, who is like homogenous in a certain sense in, t- in terms of her um, cultural identity. She is just Jamaican, nothing else, right? And we have Akua, who is a collection of Jamaica, Texas, Canada, you know, as well as like all the kind of like losses that she has sustained along the way. And I want to kind of like throw, throw them into high relief to kind of show the, 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 show the real kind of like value, show the, the beauty, show the utility, show like the just humanness, right? Off the kind of like di- diversity of the ways of being. Well, I, I mean, there's also the issue of race, which I mean, I think you touched upon it earlier. You said that it's not easy to be a, a black person in the United States, but mm-hmm. one aspect of Akua's migration from Jamaica to the States to Canada is the fact that she and her family were leaving a predominantly black country and place and suddenly finding themselves having to integrate into uh, a whiter community and a country where white supremacy has sort of Mm -hmm. reigned from its inception. Mm -hmm. That adds an element. And I think it also adds an interesting element when you consider her return to Jamaica. Mm -hmm. It must be interesting to be a black person living in a white place like Vancouver and to to return to a place like Jamaica and suddenly be like, you know, no longer a minority. Yeah. And so that, that element that adds complexities. It does. It does. Yeah, I talk about this all the time with my wife because she's African American, and the this idea of being black, right? Like when you live in a place like Jamaica or Trinidad or Nigeria, you do not think of yourself as black, right? Like you do. Why would you? That's like saying the sky is blue. You know, everyone is black, so why point out the common denominator? Like saying we're all humans, and so um, the the kind of like added complication of race, right? Um, And as well as its attendant uh, contrived um, collectiveness, right? Which I delve into a bit in the novel of when you're black, you're told that you are all off off a piece, right? You're, You're kind of told that you are all one community, which could not be further from the truth, right? Like, because within those discussions, there is a glossing over of the differences in culture. It is very different to be Zim, Bob Zimbabwean than it is to be Jamaican, than it is to be from Guyana, than it is to be from Nigeria, right? And so that's one of the things that I wanted to really explore was this question of within Blackness, what do we do with culture, right? Um, uh and then how that can both harm and hurt, if that makes any sense. You know, like if like a if like because of the kind of like white suprem suprem supremacist op- oppression, if like a white person rejects you or is mean to you in any sort of way, that you expect it, right? Versus if you are a Jamaican and then but you but you have now internalized idea that you are black and you go towards an African-American and there is a complete kind of like two ships missing each other in the night, how that pain can feel very personal, right? And it can feel very like a, like a, like a, like a, like a individual damning, if that makes any sense. Um, And so, yeah, this, this extra layer of racism, which is, very interesting because it's one of those things where because it's not what you were born with as a black person from a black nation that when you come to a white nation it's like it's unwieldy you don't know what to do with it because you haven't been oriented towards it since since birth so it's acting on you but you never really know how to what to what to do with it you know how to fully see it 
and understand it and to make it work for you in, in whatever way that you can. I'm curious to know, since you've lived in both places, what the, uh, the differences might be as a black woman in, say, the United States, especially like in Texas. I think New York City is kind of its own entity that you've described mm-hmm. it's, where it's, its, own it's, it's easier, it's easier uh, to be there. And, but I'm curious to know about your experiences in the United States versus your experiences in Canada. Is it easier to be a black woman in Canada than it is in the United States or vice versa? Or is there no difference? I mean, like what? I'm calculating how honest I want to be in my answer. <laughs> um, there are differences. There are differences. Um, so I'll say to any kind of black immigrants who are listening to this and are trying to pick a place of where to land in the US, I would not recommend going to rural Southern Texas as your first <laughs> entry point. That is, it's just simply because when, if, you, if you go to even a city like Houston or Austin or Milwaukee even, you know, like just the cities, there is, um, they are used to difference right? There's already kind of like a built-in muscle within the city culture to absorb something that they haven't encountered before, right? Versus, I mean, and they, and it's not going to be easy. You're still going to come up against all the kind of obstacles and barriers and difficulties that come with integrating into a new, a new culture, but at least there will already be a process in place of other people having already done it before. Um, and so it was, it's, it was a real shock, right? It was a real shock, um, going from Jamaica to Texas. Where, in, then, where in Texas? Um, a tiny, tiny town called Victoria. It's two hours South of Houston, four hours from the Mexican border. Okay. Yes. Um, and, um, and how like that was such a real shock to the system and it's a real shock to the system in the sense that it is in, it is literally like the air is buzzing with how much you are not the predominant thing, right? Like it is, you, there's no, con, there's, it's impossible to be confused about where you lie on the hierarchy of who is a person and, and who isn't. In Canada, the thing that I often tell my parents, because they live there now um, and they love it, hi mom, um, is in Canada, I often feel like we have handed, like we as black people have handed the short stick to someone else in that the same treatments that I, or not the same, but like similar treatment to what I experienced in the US is the treatment that is given to indigenous Canadians. Right, that like they kind of like that the brazenness and the baldness of, you know, where you land on that spectrum of personhood is quite clear. That being said, one of the reasons that I kind of returned to the US after living in Canada, because it sounds like, well, like, yes, it's good to be aware of that and like you're such a, you know, um, uh, uh, empathetic and, you know, intellectually aware person, but like, it sounds like your life is better. Why wouldn't you just stay there? Is because Canada has myth, myth, mythologized itself as a multicultural country, the racism has just gone underground, right? It's gone from being aggressive to being passive, passive aggressive. You know, it's very unspoken, it's highly coded, it is deeply, it is deeply veiled, right? It is hidden, but again, you sense it, like you know it's there. Um, and that for me personally drove me insane. I would rather know upfront <laughs> what you think of me. I get it. I get it. Where I stand. Yeah. No, I get it. Then like, then just, and because then you just feel crazy all the time. You just feel like you're being constantly gaslit, but you can't point out by whom or how or what they're doing or not doing. I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. Yeah. I mean, it's like, yeah. Cause I mean, I think in the popular consciousness, or at least in my consciousness, I have this idea of Canada as an, a nice country. I feel like it sort of gets branded that way as like the it's nice neighbor. Better regulated country. That's what I will say. It is better regulated to like um, create a kind of stable equilibrium. 
but I would not, the nice, the niceness is, uh, it's practiced. It's very practiced. Yeah. Well, they have this thing in the upper Midwest. I mean, and my wife is from Minnesota. They call it Minnesota nice, mm -hmm. which I, I think was sort of, uh, sent up like as, you know, in a kind of satirical way in the movie Fargo. Yep. You know, where people are like really bright and sunny, but there's like a menace underneath it yes. <laughs> and an unhappiness. And I, I'm with you. Like, I would rather just know where I stand with people. It's much yep. easier to navigate a culture where if people don't like me, they signal it and I can just move on. I can just move on. I can be like, okay, not yeah. you. Next. Ra rather, I, I don't want phoniness. You know, that's yeah. the thing. You know, I don't yeah. want to have to be wondering, is this person smiling because they're actually happy to see me or do they want to yeah. kill me? You know, yes. like, and that's destabilizing. I get that. Uh, yeah. And I just, I don't understand anybody who would want it the opposite. You know, yeah. I think, uh, but I think yeah. there are some people who prefer that. They prefer not yeah. to be I confronted. Mean, for my parents, I understand it. They're retired, you know, they're, they're, they don't want to have to fight in every single interaction. They're just looking for, you know, their high, highly regulated sense of peace. I completely understand it, you know, and again, to any Canadians listening, I'm not saying that you're a bad country. Like it is, it's just, it, it takes us, I think it's just the, in the person, in the personal personalities for whom that is their thing. I am not one of them. Mm. Well, and I think too, you know, it gets complex because I think there are different gradations of this kind of passive aggression. Mm -hmm. Some of it is born. Some of it is a real passive aggression where it's mm -hmm. aggression that is mm -hmm. passive. Mm -hmm. Some of it where it's subtle is like born of fear and people just being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And maybe being too comfortable in their uh, supremacy or something, but it's mm -hmm. not—it doesn't—it's not laced with real menace. Do you know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there's like different ways that it manifests, I would imagine. And it's like even having to officiate that and suss that out is exhausting. Yeah. You know, I'd rather just—I'd yeah. rather just sort of know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to shift gears and I want to talk to you about the writing of this book, mm -hmm. and in particular the integration of uh, Jamaican Patois, which mm -hmm. occurs throughout the sections of the book, I mean, throughout mm -hmm. the book, but especially the section that takes place in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I loved it. Like I loved reading this book in January because it, you know, it's colder. I know I live in Los Angeles, so I'm a big wimp, but like, it's nice to go to the islands in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I like yeah. when books yeah. take me places. I love when books like travel me, you know? And awesome. so Awesome. It was lovely to go. I've never been to Jamaica, so it was also a kind of fun to be on the ground there with Akua and to get to kind of experience it with um, with Jamaicans, you know, and mm -hmm. to see it through that lens rather than, mm -hmm. say, you know, a book where it's narrated by some tourist or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Though what's interesting is that Akua, despite being a native of Jamaica and uh, having family there and whatnot, sort of is a tourist yep. in her Absolutely. bearing when she's Absolutely. there, which that's an interesting nuance to the story is the fact that she's kind of a, you know, she's kind of a fish out of water. It's kind of a yep. tourist story with her yep. returning there and kind of feeling her way around, even though yeah. she has, you know, a little more cultural fluency than, you know, most people, but, yeah. um, but just to the integration of Jamaican Patois and making sure to keep readers like me oriented, mm -hmm. I never had a problem with it and I quite liked it. Awesome. Um, were there any challenges in that regard, writing it? No, I think um, this is one of those things where uh, when thinking through, you know, what her return would look like, right? And to kind of go back to what I mentioned earlier, that Tamika is a Jamaican of the land and Akua is a Jamaican of the mind, right? That there would be this kind of disconnect between what she thinks of as Jamaican, which is based on these kind of like snapshots in time, right? This Jamaica that is frozen forever within her head versus the country that kept on, that kept on going, you know? And so um, I made very conscious decisions while writing to kind of use that as also a tool through which the reader could become oriented to Jamaican culture, right? That as she is kind of like reintroducing herself to Jamaican Hatwa, you know, as it is spoken as like a everyday conversant language, right? And she's doing the kind of like linguistic math to kind of like get on the same page as everyone else. That also presented an opportunity to me as a writer to help the reader 
do the same, right? And so because the reader, you know, every time you read, you read a book, you are a tourist in someone else's world, right? You, you didn't, you are, you are there for the 200, 300, 500 pages, which is a three day, four day, seven day vacation, right? And so while drafting, I wanted to both create a thing that when another Jamaican reads it, 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 it reads as rich and true, right? It doesn't feel like I have cheapened the, the culture or this what I'm really afraid of over explained any of the culture, but that it, but that it also feels very open and accessible for anyone who wants to kind of like buy their ticket and take and take the time and sit with this story and to be immersed in this in 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 the story and to be part of this journey as well. Yeah, I've had that conversation on this show before about not wanting to over explain mm -hmm. and to center readers uh, that have no uh, relation to Jamaica. This is a story about Jamaica. So mm -hmm. you shouldn't have to sit there and create a kind of code key for yeah. readers, you know, who a legend, aren't, you know? yeah, a legend. Exactly. That's what I meant. And so one of the joys of reading this book for me was to read the Jamaican Patois mm -hmm. and to sort of figure it out and to have yeah. to just kind of like suss it out. And then I, yeah. I must also confess that it was fun to read aloud. Like Jamaican Patois is fun to say. <laughs> it is. It is a very jocular lang lang language. Where, where does it, I, I wish I had better understanding of, of, its origins, you know, the, yeah. the, the origins it's, of Jamaican Patois. Cause like, where does it come from? Do you know? Yeah. I, I have a very kind of like broad, broad strokes understanding. Again, it's, it's, I, I haven't actually done like the full linguistic, you know, down the rabbit hole because it is for me, one of those things that like, I know, and I feel, and I live and is like a part, a part, a part of me, but I've never fully investigated. Right. Um, which echoes a, a section from the book where, uh, this idea of like cornrows, which we all call it, but like I truly don't know why we call it that. We just do. Um, and so I know in broad strokes terms that it is a mixture of um, West African dialects with English. Um, but And it is um, primarily an oral language in the sense that... Um, Hello, Jamaicans who are going to, who are, who are going to read my book. Um, the, the there is there is no consensus around how to spell patois on the page, and that's honestly one of the things that I love about this language is that it is a language that is always under revision. Every time it is spoken, it is being remade, recast to fit the image of the person who's speaking. Right. Mm. And so that was also one of the things that I wanted to explore in the book is that as Akua begins to kind of like better understand, and then as she begins to use Patois as well, how she is also remaking it in her own image, where it is now infected with not only the historical pieces of West African and British, but also of her um, inner kaleidoscope as someone who has lived in um, the US and Canada, right? To create a language that that is wholly her own, that only fits within her mouth. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting how powerful Jamaican Patois is as a cultural force globally, mm -hmm. when you think about it. Like, there have got to be like regional dialects all over the world that I have no idea about. But I think the average person could do an approximation, like a yeah. bad approximation, but an approximation of Jamaican Patois. And I guess that's yeah. at least partly due to the fact that reggae music is so popular all over the planet and that the mm -hmm. rhythms of that language are in they've that traveled. music. Yeah, they've traveled. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just like growing up in the States and then in Canada, was the Patois spoken in your family? Is this something that you feel like you have a grasp on or did you have, was there a learning curve for you to integrated into your novel? No, um, I will also admit to, I have always been like a, a language nerd um, and I've always been obsessed with linguistics. I remember being a child in Jamaica um, uh, and actually being in the car with my eldest sister and saying, you know, something along the lines of like, you know, how would you, how would you, how would you spell smarty? Which is somebody, but it's been in, in Jamaican Patois, it's Samadhi. 
Um, and her kind of looking at me, she's like a much more log logical thinker than I am. And her looking at me and just being like, there's no consensus around this, the spelling. And immediately my my brain went to, well, how would I spell it? And I actually started to like, you know, actually um, uh, like imagine in my head all the letters and how I would orient them, like playing a game of banana, bananagrams. Um, and so infusing Patois into, into my novel was actually one of the first impulses that I had, because to me, it is so foundational to Jamaican culture and it is so foundational to that idea of the kind of like cultural pastiche, right? And how it is always evolving and changing, you know, and how, and because it is always evolving and changing, then that means there is always space for something new, you know, um, which I mean, then, just made it such the perfect vehicle for like, you know, showing Jamaican-ness, showing migration, and also showing queer, queerness and fam and family all through this kind of like central thing. So when you mentioned earlier that, you know, just a moment ago that you were in Jamaica and you were talking to your sister about how to spell somebody, somebody, somebody. Yeah. was that when you were living there or was that when you were visiting? When I was living there. So what age were you when you moved to Texas? I believe, oh, I should call my mother and ask. I believe I was 12. 12. Okay. So you had a good portion of your childhood mm -hmm. in Jamaica. Yep. And you were in Kingston? No. <laughs> uh -huh. No, no, no. I am from a town called Mandeville, which is in the very middle of the island. It's on a plateau. It is um, the, the, in terms of, temperature the coolest um city on the island that's why my mother chose it um my parents are from kingston i would visit all the time as a child i hated kingston then i still hate it now it is so hot it is a quagmire of stink and filth I, I, I don't understand where anyone lives there. I just, it is not, at the same time, I think it's wonderful and rich and beautiful, but not for me, not for me. And, and so, yet you, you set part of your novel there. <laughs> I did because I think honestly, and again, this goes back to the kind of like ventriloquist act of fiction that if I had said it in Mandeville, it would have it it would have felt too on the nose for me. It would have felt like you know too much of myself, and I wouldn't have had the space or the freedom to play, right? And so I said it in somewhere in another city that people would rec would recognize, right? Everyone knows that Kingston is is capital of Jamaica, and it, and, it, and, it, and it's a place that I have memories of that I could borrow that I could borrow from for the purpose of writing this book. But it was just a totally you know imaginative, open, open field, right? Where I had the space and the freedom to do what I needed to do to both kind of like undo all those knots um, in the uh, e emotional complexities that I was um, describing earlier, as well as, you know, somewhere where, where I could just construct story, you know, make up fiction. Yeah, that makes sense, you know, yeah. to you just to give yourself a kind of new tableau and to just get out of the if you're tied too much to the places and the people you know, it you begins get, to hinder. You start to lock up. Health. You start to lock up creatively. <laughs> yeah. So it's the same. I have the same feeling around um, doing research for novels, which is that you know one of the things that people ask, "How much did you research this?" Not very much. Um, I researched enough to like know the basics of to know the basics of what I needed to know, and then off I went. Um, because there is, it is possible to over research something. It is possible to like, to like personally oversaturate yourself in something to the point that you begin to feel beholden to a certain kind of truth, right? Whether it be personal truth because you lived there and you had these experiences there. And so if these don't end up in the story, then like you're not telling the, the story right. As well as it, it can begin to feel overburdened in terms of, you're putting in so much context that the context essentially 
creates like becomes like a um a con a concrete cage around the story itself and the story can't move or grow or or progress for for forward and it begins to kind of in a way lock down your imaginative sense of play you know which so i'm always very like i always tell other writers like be wary of, of that balance between research and writing hey you fooled me i had no idea I, like i believed every word of it and it's interesting that you say that it's causing me to recall a conversation i had many years ago maybe even in the earliest days of this show with a writer who was i think it was a short story that was set in africa mm -hmm. and this writer is a white guy mm -hmm. and i was talking to him and i was like this is really magnificently done like I have to believe you've traveled to Africa. Like, were you in the Peace Corps? I forget what I was asking him, but I was like, yeah. "You must have been in Africa to write this." Play. And he's like, "Oh no," he's like, "I just Googled it," you know. And I was like, "What?" And that's what he did. All of his research online, he got a sense yeah. of the place, and then he's like, "The rest I did with my imagination." Mm -hmm. And I was like, "Oh yeah," like you, you do want to get the details right, like the big details, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily have to have like a granular. Mm -hmm level of research in order to mm -hmm. write a place imaginatively yeah, yeah. that is a, people have had the same thing at that people say oh you must be from kingston you are so evocatively and i say no um thank you to the tr um trans the um uh um the kind of like the powers of youtube <laughs> Right, any kind of details that I needed to know, I would go on on YouTube. Um, you know, look up a video of you know driving down King Street, Jamaica, nineteen ninety. Play, um, and then I would essentially just find like a you know that a collection of details from those videos, pair it with you know my kind of like memoried understandings of the city, and then make stuff up to fill in the spaces in between to then, you know, create something that is holistic and evocative and rich and to the reader feels real, you know? Well, I think that's probably not the most uncommon strategy. I think a lot of people probably, a lot of writers probably turn to YouTube mm -hmm. to do research about place. Like, and if you're not, it's kind of foolish. Why wouldn't you? It's all yeah. there. You can find Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to ask you about your history as a writer like how you sure. got into this sure. racket like sure. were you one of these racket. people who from that's a great word <laughs> it, it it is a racket <laughs> <laughs> i mean what better word right and yeah. were you one of these kids who from the jump knew that she wanted to be a writer or is it something you came to later in life yeah it's so cliche and like saccharine and like you know want and like hallmark movie yes but it i am i'm one of those kids who i you know started um i remember being i think i was in the third grade and this is in jamaica um and i decided to write a story set in the kind of style and rhythm as an rl stein novel um i made it i made as far as two chapters before i said that it was too hard and i gave up um but the point is is that i've i've always been a writer and i've always wanted to write and it wasn't really until i was about 12 or 13 or 13 that i truly was just like one day i'm gonna i'm gonna I'm, I'm i'm gonna write and publish a novel um you know but the 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 joke i often tell is that you know this is all my mother's fault you know um because when we were kids in Jamaica, you know, she had three rambunctious girls on her hand and in these long summer breaks and my mother, both, both, both of my parents worked. Um, and this whole kind of like American notion of send them to summer camp, send them to day school or whatever, that does not exist. At, at least it, it might exist now, but when I was a child in Jamaica, that was not an option. There were no little arts and craftsy things. You could, you could just shove your kid off on somebody else. You had to you had to take care of your kids in the summer, and so my mother's kind of like um, a busy work tactic was that she would sit us each down in the living room with stacks and stacks of books. I mean, more books than like books that if and if they toppled over, they would crush. They would crush me. 
so many books. It's a lot of books. It was. <laughs> and our kind of um, directive was to read as many of them as we could, because then at the end of each day, when she would come home, she would ask us about it. As like, what did you read to today? What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? So, so wait, can I just ask, you were just unsupervised kids? You yeah. just had books and you yep. were left home? Yep. But the thing is, our mother, she is a force. She is a, she is, she is a uh, beautiful lightning rod through this world. I will brag on my mother for just a second. She um, is an engineer and she was the first black woman in the entire Caribbean to rise to an executive level within the mining industry, Whoa. which mining was not so much now, but was like one of the predominant industries in the Caribbean, just behind agriculture and tourism. And she was the first black woman to, to ever do it. You know, before that, it was always white women from Canada and the West that were flown into the Caribbean. Yeah, if there were women flown in at all, I, when you say mining, like mining industry, I'm not seeing a lot of women just exactly flower in my, my mother, imagination. Like, so, so just imagine, so, so for someone who could do that, imagine the fear she struck in our hearts. Right, right. She said, you have something to, to do. Okay. And we stayed home and we did it. Um, but that was kind of like my first introduction to the power of language and the transportative. That was what I was trying to find earlier. Um, in terms of YouTube, the transportative power of story. Um, you know, so by by the time I was 10, I had read all of the Arl Stein books that, that have been published to date, all of the Nancy Drew books, all of the Hardy Boys books, all of the Babysitter's Club books, all of the Nancy and Miss Lou books, and, you know, a few other, other um, um, collections that I'm sure I'm forgetting. And, and that was all instigated by my mother. Um, and so growing out of that, then I became very obsessive, you know, and very up about language. And that's, and that's what started me on this trajectory. Well, it's nice to have somebody to blame, right? You can just point Indeed. to her. <laughs> Indeed. That I, I, I didn't choose this racket. You made me. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's not my fault. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, I, I read that you were working on Broad Upsy for 11 years. Is that true? 13. 13. 13. As, yeah, I think I forget what interview it was, but I misquoted. I actually did the math 13 years. I was um, in, I was on a similar trajectory with my book. So I, I, it's like just, you know, respect to anybody who toughs it out for more than a decade. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's a long yeah, road. It is. It's a very long road. But you know, I truly don't think I would have been able to create the, the book that, you know, we all now hold in her in our hands, if it ha if it hadn't taken the time that it took, right? Because I mentioned earlier that um, so much of this novel was kind of a cathartic re release of working through a lot of the emotional complications that I myself had experienced through these kind of like made up people in this made up land. But, but a lot of those early chapters of you know her in texas remembering jamaica of her actually in jamaica of of her kind of like high high school years i wrote when i was 22 right i wrote when i was fresh out of actually experiencing it myself right and so a lot of the kind of like visceral urgency of the language the kind of like kind of like immersive experience of it stems from the fact that it was all very fresh in my head, right? That I was literally just kind of like writing, like I was kind of like writing the, the working through in real time, right? But then it took me becoming much older to be able to then look at this kind of like collection of just like explosive experiences and be able to figure out how to kind of like order it together into a cohesive story, how to kind of like put it into a package, right? That someone else could receive and, and understand, you know? So it took me being kind of like fresh out to be able to write some of that, to, to, to be able to like imbue the lang the language with the immediacy that it has. And then it took me kind of maturing and getting older to be able to see how it would all fit together and make sense 
to someone who is not me. Yeah. I mean, I have this like theory of the case kind of in the back of my brain when it comes to taking a long time to write a book. Mm -hmm. I think it tends to be good for books. Yes, I completely agree. Completely. To take a long time. That, that isn't to say that you can't write a brilliant novel in six months. I know it has been done. I know people work, re there are people who work really fast and really well, so there are no rules. Mm -hmm. But there are benefits that you're describing to the fact that you were working on this book 13 years ago. And there are mm -hmm. benefits that you're describing that could only have happened as the result of you working on it two years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I just think that really taking your time and going over it and applying your best brain mm -hmm. over the long haul, that I think that might just be the way that I work. I think it's maybe it's just same. we have that in common. And there are writers like, uh, oh, God, I'm totally blanking now. Uh, she has like the cool hair and that she always wears like suits and she won the Pulitzer Prize and I'm totally blanking on her name. The uh, Secret History. Did you win it? Oh, um, oh, I know who you mean. Oh my I can God, see this her is in front of me. I can't remember. I can totally name. see. It. This is, by the way, the, I cannot believe I'm blanking on this because I love uh, that book and then the book about the painting with the bird on it. I'm blanking on it too. This is just the most profound level of uh, mental collapse that I've maybe ever demonstrated on this show, which is saying something. But the point is, she takes ten years to write her books. I know, mm -hmm. in general, and that just seems mm -hmm. to be the cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, you shouldn't have to apologize. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, I worked and I I went through this whole process where at first, and this a lot of this has to do with the kind of like fishbowl effect of going to a place like Iowa, where while you're there, you know there are all these people who you know get two book deals and publish their first book before they even grad graduate right and those are the kind of flashy stories that the industry likes to kind of amplify you know to to essentially say that if you're not a wonder kid then you are a failure what are you even doing with yourself which is statistically not true that is such a tiny portion of the books that become published but I'll admit, like, I totally fell prey to that and for a long time felt like a loser because it took me as long as it did um, or, or as long as it, as it has. But now looking back, I wear it kind of like as a badge of pride um, in the sense that, like, you know, to, to reference what I was saying earlier, the early portions that I wrote give the kind of, like, visceral immediate immediacy and then... But then take, taking that time is how I was able to imbue the novel with any sense of wisdom. But then also, because the novel took 13 years, I had a lot of time to figure out what it is that I wanted from this project and also what it is that I wanted from my writing practice, right? So, and what is it? What is it that you want? I want to keep doing this for as long as I can. I want to connect with readers, all the, the beautiful spectrum of readers that are out there. I want, I am not focused so much on, I'm focused on quality, not quantity, meaning I'm not focused on sales, I'm focused on, Im, on impact. So I, I want to meet people and have this book mean something to them. And have and have it mean something in whatever way that 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 suits you know what they've been through and their personality, right? Um, I'm very much interested in um, connection. I'm interested in kind of like expanding conversations. I'm interested in kind of like the long term cum cum cumulative effect of applying yourself to something earn earnestly and seeing where that goes. Yeah, that's well said. And I think that you mentioned earlier some of the struggles that you had, like not just in the writing, but around the writing, like the psychological aspect of having to sort of muscle through a book over the long haul and to have mm -hmm. that stamina and then to be doing it in the context of the Iowa Writers Workshop, which mm -hmm. you attended. 
Mm-hmm. That's a there's a it can be a competitive place. You're surrounded by your peers. Candy. People are yes, yeah. So what I'm curious that I always ask people when they went to Iowa what their experience of it was was, and I've heard, as you might imagine, a range of responses mm-hmm. over the years. Mm-hmm. People all have their different angle on it, but I'm curious yeah. to know what yours is. For sure, um, you know I've had people ask me this question before, and I appreciate the way that you've phrased it which is out of like sincere curiosity, like tell me anything. You could say it was great. You could say it sucked. I would still believe you. Um, But people, when they look at me, right, as a black Jamaican immigrant who is genderqueer, and they ask, how was the Arab Writers Workshop for you? There is this kind of like unspoken expectation that I'm going to say that it was awful and terrible and people were racist and all the, all and all of the isms, which I have to say it wasn't. Um, I actually found it to be a deeply nurturing experience um, that that was such a gift to my writing um, because it was the gift of time, right? Like I had two years to do nothing except sit and write. It was the first times in my life that I started to define myself first and foremost as a writer because I had the space to do to do so. Um, Um, and I think I credit a lot of that to the leadership of the current director, Sam Chang, you know, who went through the workshop at a time and it was not supportive (laughs) and it was not, you know, a completely nurturing experience and has really put in the effort and, and put in the time to make it so, to make it become that. Now, was it a complete utopic Eden? No. But what I will say is that people were people were very human in their assholeness, right? Like someone was being an asshole to me because they were an asshole versus it being a kind of like oppressive dismissal, if that makes any sense. So it was cold. It's in the middle of nowhere. You have nothing to do except drink and write. <laughs> um, but I found it to be a real kind of boon to my writing because of the gift of that of that time. Um, and also, just to brag for a second, I had, you know, one of the best cohorts that I think has come through the workshop in recent years. Um, so. Like who, Deshaun, who, who are you? I know who you who you who you who you, re, who you recently had was also part of my cohort. Deshaun Charles Winslow, who recently guested. You also mentioned Sam Chang. Uh, Lance Samantha Chang has guested on this show. I talked yeah. to her about her book when it came She's out. But awesome. so Deshaun was part of your cohort. Who else did you go to Iowa with? Um, uh, Escort David Johnson, um, Derek, who I think p- publishes under DK Neuro. Donnie Walton, um, Lakeisha, La- Lakeisha Carr, um, Lindsay Hunt, um, Kylie. Nope, Kylie was two years after uh, after me, but in the general vicinity. Um, Melissa Mogolon, whose book comes out in May, I believe, um, and just a number of other really wonderful folk. And when you were talking earlier about how the program was nurturing and welcoming in ways that it previously might not have been, at least not mm-hmm. to this degree. And mm-hmm. a lot of that you say is to uh, Sam Chang's credit. Mm-hmm. Like specifically, were there things that, that she's done or things that have been implemented into the program to make it so? Yeah. It's obviously it's obviously more diverse in its student population. Even yeah. I can notice that like as For an sure. outside, you know, as a podcaster, sure. I'm like, oh, wow, they're doing a better job of bringing in writers from a variety of different backgrounds into mm-hmm. that program than they mm-hmm. previously did. But yeah. are there other specific things that the program is doing that you think are effective in that way? Yeah. And so um, one of the things that I really love about the Iron Writers Workshop is that it truly is the strength of your writing sample is everything. So I had... Um, colleagues while I was there, as well as the other people who have graduated since, who have gotten into this master's level, right, prestigious writing program, and don't have a bachelor's degree, right? Because it was truly, if your writing is good enough, and if you, and if in your um, letter of intent, you show that you are eager and teachable, then we will find a way to get you here. And so one of the things that I think Sam has done for the program is to make the program 
actually true to its convictions. Like it actually does and says and believes what it puts into the world that it says and does and believes. Um, uh, she's also kind of done very smartly done away with, with a lot of the kind of uh, internal obstacles that made um, a nurturing community impossible. You know, I'm not sure if anyone's told you this kind of horror story bef before, but it used to be that you had to um, compete for funding every year you were in the program. And after you submitted your application and it was assessed the way that they told you, right, who got funded and who didn't, is that they would print a list and they would simply tack it to the bullet to the bulletin board in Die House, which is the department office. So everyone could see if you came in last, right? Everyone could see that you were in the middle of the list. So it was a means of kind of like hazing <laughs> is the way that I would describe describe it. Um, and so Sam has really worked to do away with that by now. Everyone has the same level of funding. Um, I believe now you do not have to reapply in your second year. Um, and I think it's even moving towards a model where, because it used to be that some people got two years to just write versus some people had to like um, first first year just writing, second year had to teach. And I think now she's moving towards making that equitable across all positions. And so by putting in by putting in all of those like administrative equalizers, right? It takes it it takes the teeth out of people who would weaponize their the fact that they are an asshole <laughs> to then kind of like be a like tyr tyrannical and like oppressive force amongst the the student body. Like percentage wise, if you had to give me a number, what percentage of the people are assholes? <laughs> I think it really varies from year to year. Um, you know, because I've, sp I've spoken to students since who have said, yeah, half, half my year was insufferable. And I'm so sorry. You know, whereas I think that while I was there, I would say it was 10% were assholes. Um, and everyone else was there to really kind of learn. Um, so that's one of the beautiful things about the workshop. Also one of the difficult things is that so much of your experience is dictated by who else you got in with. Right. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you lucked out. I did. I did. I really, I loved my year and I've heard many prof prof professors who were around in that time and past who have said that we were a lovely year. So yeah, yes. There you go. Well, it's been great talking with you and great to meet you. Congratulations on this novel. Congratulations on seeing it through and doing what it took to make Thank it a reality. You. I have to believe your family is excited for you and, and your mom, you know, this must be a triumph for her too. She's like, see, I, I almost buried you in books and this is, uh, this <laughs> is the result. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. She is. I always ask people too, if they are working on anything else, I don't mean to be rude since you're at the end of a 12, 13 year process here, but yeah. do you have anything else in the pipeline? Um, so I, the idea of starting another novel makes me want to jump off the GW. So we're not, <laughs> we're going to not do that. Yeah, we don't want um, that. <laughs> therefore, you know, I'm working now on short form, but I'm trying to kind of grow my brain in like more interesting ways. So I'm trying, I'm trying my hand at doing creative nonfiction. Um, I had just finished like two or three essays that are, that are now with my agent, um, and also trying to do a creative nonfiction that are on just different topics. So things that I'm interested in, but are not things that I've already devoted an entire book, book to. So okay. one is an essay, um, about my relationship with my weight, um, when I was 18, I weighed 301 pounds. Um, wow. and yep. And now, um, I'm a healthy 180, most of which, most of which is muscle because I have now been bodybuilding for 12, for 12 years. Um, and so, wow, you about... buried the lead. We didn't even get to, I mean, bodybuilding for 12 years. I would have never guessed that you look super fit. 
Thank you. I mean, just from the, the I mean, I'm only seeing you from like yeah, the shoulders I'm up. I'm a short person, so you can't really see much, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and so like, yeah, so that's the thing that I've, I've been trying to figure out, like, again, that this whole idea of these like emotional complexities and then working through them on the page, you know, that was, again, another kind of like break in my own kind of sense of self um, and trying to reconcile that person at 301 with this person now. And also that person at 301 with like long hair and push-up bras versus this person with short hair. And This hair. feels like a memoir. That's what people have told me. I wrote the draft and people were like, this is a roadmap for a memoir. And I said, please don't mention anything book length for at least <laughs> five to six years. Like, please. <laughs> um, so we'll, 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 we'll see. I mean, I'm very much trying to heed the advice of many um, uh, mid-career authors who are just like, don't force it. Right. If you try to force yourself to go start some like amazing new project hot off the heels of your first one, but you are cognitively not ready, you will just end up frustrating yourself, right? By the like false starts and the spinning your wheels and just the wasted energy and the wasted pages. When the idea is, you know, cooked enough to 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 then kind of arrive in words you'll feel it and you'll know it yes so. i think there's truth in that i think too one way to trick yourself into writing a book is to just write short pieces that which maybe uh, that's what i'm doing so. maybe that's what you're doing i'm just going to put that out there as a possibility uh you know i've kind of I, I i think what you're saying has a lot of truth in it i think personally i'm also thinking like sometimes you can tell yourself you're not cognitively ready for too long so yes. don't wait too long don't wait too yes. long get back yeah. to work we need more books from you uh congratulations best of luck with the you know the rollout of this book and the tour and the all the stuff that goes along with it and good luck on finding your way to the next thing thank you i appreciate it and thank and thank you so much for such like a rich and varied and interesting conversation <laughs>